this is the last of our very, very close series. Um, we have not, in, in all of the uh, spiritual disciplines that we've spoken of, we've not addressed solitude, we've not addressed giving, we've not addressed journaling. But this morning I want to end this series on talking about service to the Lord as a spiritual discipline. I'd ask you to join me in John chapter 13 this morning. John 13 is a very humbling passage for me. It's a great reminder of the humanity and the divinity of Jesus. And as you've heard me say before, John, probably better than any of the other gospel writers takes both the humanity and the divinity of Jesus and places them so closely together in the example. And it really, it's clearly seen in John chapter 13. I want you to follow me. I want to read this text. It's a very lengthy text this morning, but I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, depth to it as well. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said not all of you were clean. And when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things... Blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I've chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place. So when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Jesus is in the upper room with the disciples. Much of this last part of John takes place in this discourse. We've got Jesus' priestly prayer in John chapter 17. We've got his teachings on the Holy Spirit in chapters 14, 15, 16. Jesus is spending this intimate moment with his disciples, having celebrated Passover and instituted the Lord's Supper. This, on the timeline, is just before he goes out into the garden and is betrayed. This is really the, the, the moment before Jesus really begins this moment, this season of deep suffering, of emotional anguish, spiritual trauma. This is just before that moment when, uh, when, when the enemy seems to want to overpower him. He is betrayed by Judas. He is left by his disciples. He is suffering. We know the story. This stands right at the front door 
of that event. And Jesus does something truly unprecedented. Jesus, as John records, understands where he is, who he is, where he's going, and understanding that he is God, knowing he is God. He takes a towel, and here is where John is able to sandwich both the humanity and the divinity of Jesus and slap them so closely together. And this morning, I want to look at this passage because Jesus has said in his own words, he did this for us as an example of servanthood. He gave it to us to be able to see and understand and realize what it means to be a servant to other people. Now, obviously, if you've been in church any length of time in your life, you've probably heard the pastor or Sunday school teacher or deacon, you've probably heard them talk about the significance and the importance of individual service to Christ, both in the church, outside of the church, being Christ-like, being his hands and feet to those around. And oftentimes, you've heard as well, probably, the percentage, right, that 20% of the people in the church do 80% of of the work. You've probably heard those statistics, and frankly, I don't know that those statistics are ever really proven. I don't know that there's any way to really check that for sure, because I don't know all of what you do. I don't know all of where you do it. But what I know is this, is that when I open my Bible to John 13, and I become familiar once again with the example that Jesus has given me, I find myself woefully lacking in the area of service. And we're going to cover several of these areas, but I want you to consider first this morning this. I want you to look at the action itself. I want you to see, if Jesus is giving us an example, I want you to see the action that he utilizes to teach us what it means, the the principles of servanthood and service as a spiritual discipline. He is there in that upper room with the disciples, and he takes this basin of water, takes it down, and begins to wash the disciples' feet. Now, in context, historically, this was a task that was reserved for not just a slave, but really the lowest of the slaves. Their job was to honor the guests at the table, the guests at the room, the special guests that were there, and their job was to do just that. The lowest of the slaves had the task of washing feet. And I know some of you may just even the thought of feet just freak you out. I don't really understand that so much because we all have feet. It's like saying, I don't like hands. I mean, you can't get away from them, right? Maybe it's just other people's feet. I don't know. You can't really get rid of these, guys. I guess you can cover them up with socks and shoes. I'm digressing. I apologize. (laughs) Jesus takes this moment. Remember, put it back in the time frame. This is when Jesus is sharing this moment with the disciples. Right before he dives into the depths of his sorrow. Right before he goes out to Gethsemane. Right before he is betrayed with a kiss. In a moment that that we would all probably honestly say he dragged the depths of the human condition. Right before that, what do we find him doing? Lifting up others. Honoring others. The one who sat at the table who deserved to be honored above everybody else. The one who should have had a line made to wash his feet. That one is the one we find in this place of humility, this place of service, the lowest place, taking on himself the form of a slave and serving and washing the dirty feet of dirty disciples. I want you to think for a minute of the simplicity of this act. Not just its timing, but its simplicity. Jesus, in an example to us, did something that every one of us is capable of doing. Jesus did something that everybody could have done, but nobody was doing. Jesus did something. Listen, there are certain things Jesus did that we can't do. 
I can't heal blind eyes. I, I can't raise the dead. I can't do those things. I can't multiply fish sandwiches to feed thousands of people. I can't do that. But I can do this. He lowered this bar in a sense of service to do something that everybody in that room could have done but nobody was doing. And the one who should have been having his feet washed was the one turning around to the others and taking that place of the lowest slave. And I want you to think about service for a moment. You and I are drawn to service. Those of us that serve. You and I are drawn to serve when it's something that is exciting. When it's something that has the offer of adventure. When it's something that has a reward or may have recognition in it. Think about that for a minute. If it's exciting, if it's adventurous, if it's something that I might get recognized for or has some way for me to be rewarded, what do we do? We often want to sign up for that. And you know, in the church, we're just as guilty sometimes, aren't we? In an attempt to share needs with us, in the, with, with the church body, as far as service opportunities within the church, what are we tempted to do? We're tempted to say this. Guys, let me tell you something. We've got a children's ministry, and it's booming, and it's fun. 75% of the people in children's ministry will tell you that it's not fun, (laughs) okay? That's just a reality. But what do we do? We find ourselves in leadership when we're talking. We understand what God's doing. We get to see behind the curtain. We see these needs coming, and what do we do? We know that we almost want it to sound adventurous, and not that we're lying, not that we're trying to to deceive. We want to try to tell you it's going to be fun, but you know what's wrong with all of these words? If we're drawn to the, the area of service because it's adventurous, exciting, rewarding, or recognizing, what's wrong with that? Every one of those has me at the center of it. I want to go on an adventure. I want to do something exciting. I want to do something where people are going to look at me and they're going to say, that right there is a good man. You know what's wrong with that? That's not what the heart of service is about. The heart of service for Christ is about Jesus first. Others next, and me last. Because if I'm serving because it is exciting or adventurous, or there may be some kind of reward, or there may be some kind of recognition, what happens when the excitement wanes? What happens when it's no longer fun? What happens? When nobody recognizes my work. You see, if that self-promoting reason or self-fulfilling reason is why we serve, then when those things are removed, and they will be, they will be, they will go, what happens? My reason for serving leaves. But when I keep my priorities right, that it's Jesus first, When I throw open my Bible and I pour over John 13, I realize Jesus wasn't doing that to simply wash their feet. The truth of the matter is this. I'm going to be really honest with you. Much of the service that we have in this church, much of the areas that we serve, and I can only speak for the ones in here, much of the areas in service here are by nature unspectacular. They're mundane. They're people preparing meals for students. They're teachers working through the week to prepare a lesson and then going into a room and teaching that lesson and wonder if those kids are even listening to them. You know what it is? It's people standing in the hallways giving high fives to kids as they go into their classroom. It's people greeting people at the door. 
Much of what we do here is unspectacular in itself. And I don't mean to say it's not worth it. I'm not saying it's not, not, not enjoyable at times, but it's practical, it's mundane, it's unnoticed, and it's unspectacular. And if we're trying to compete, if we're trying to recruit people into service of the Lord because it's exciting, we're doing you a disservice. The simplicity of this act is mind-boggling. That Jesus obviously intentionally did this. He wanted to do this. This simple act from our Savior is humbling at best. I don't know why you serve. You're the only one that can determine that. I don't even know if all of you are serving. I don't know. But as the body of Christ, our privilege is to be that, the body of Christ, the tangible hands, feet, and mouth, and heart of Jesus. And we get to flesh that out in many different ways. Though they are mundane and unnoticed often and and practical and unspectacular on their best day most of the time, I tell you this, they are worth it. They're valuable. You see, the kingdom of God has always been advanced through the unspectacular, unselfish efforts of people who loved Jesus and loved others. We have been carried to this moment in our, in our life by people who took the lowest place, by people who cared enough to get involved and didn't care if they got the recognition. I want you to see for a moment, number two, I want you to see, we've looked at the action. I want you to see for a moment the recipients. I think it's safe for us to say that these recipients did not expect this action. Though they would have culturally understood that somebody would have washed their feet normally, it's safe for us to say that none of them expected it. We can see Peter's reaction, Lord, you're not ever going to wash my feet. Peter was ashamed because Jesus, so holy, God, the Messiah, the anointed one, had lowered himself to that place to wash his feet. Peter was humbled by it and embarrassed. Not only did they not expect it, They didn't ask for it. Nobody at that room, nobody in that room do we have any record of them saying, hey, is somebody going to come over and wash my feet? Jesus wasn't fulfilling a need that the disciples had requested. He took it upon himself. He initiated it. And I I want you to hear this really well. Not one of those recipients deserved it. If you would have taken the best person in the world outside of Jesus... If you would have looked and tried to find the most holy person and put them in that chair, they still would have been undeserving of that action that Jesus took. You see, in just a few moments after Jesus does this, Peter's going to mess up. Peter messes up in the moment. First he tells Jesus what he doesn't want him to do, and then when Jesus says, I'm going to do it, Peter tells him how to do it. Peter's going to go out in a little bit and chop off the ear of a servant. Peter's going to complicate things. Judas is going to betray him with a kiss, and they're all going to run away. Don't get me wrong. If I was in that situation, I probably would have too. I can talk a big game 2,000 years this side of it, but in the moment, I probably would have run too. Not one of those guys was deserving of that action. I want you to see what John does, and I'm telling you, I've never noticed this before until I was preparing for this this week. What was the action? Jesus was washing their feet, right? I want you to notice what Jesus does. The living Word of God highlights something that, has, that I have missed all of these years. And when I finally got what He was saying, it blew my mind. Listen to what Jesus says. Look at verse 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. That means serving. Now look at verse 18. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. 
But the scripture will be fulfilled. What scripture? He who ate my bread has lifted his what? Heel against me. Jesus, the living word of God, went back and in an attempt to stamp this moment, to punctuate the action that he was doing, just so you and I, 2,000 years later, would not miss the gravity and the weight and the greatness and the humility of Jesus, just so we wouldn't ever miss it. He says this, this is so the prophecy will be fulfilled. What prophecy? He who has lifted his heel against me. Jesus washed the feet of Judas. There should, no, there should not be any surprise to us that we realize that when one washes somebody's feet, they pick them up and they set them on their leg and they wash them or set them down in the basin. What Jesus was saying was, I'm literally washing the heel of the one who has lifted that heel against me. What do we want to do when we're considering service? We want to consider the caliber of the person we're serving. We want to consider how much are they really worth my love? How much are they really worth my time and my effort? How much of me am I really willing to give up for this person? Jesus washed the heel of the one who lifted his heel against him. That heel would then leave this room and run and grab a mob. That heel would lead that mob back to that garden and would betray him with a kiss. From head to toe, this guy was evil. That heel would also lead him to a tree because of his guilt. The recipients didn't expect it. They didn't ask for it. They didn't deserve it. And look at verse 7. Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Jesus did something for people who didn't get it. He knew they weren't going to understand it. That moment, the weight and the gravity of what he was doing was missed. He was willing to do something that nobody else in the room fully understood. Man, what a model. We come to Jesus, number three, the servant. told you in this series, in this sermon, that Jesus did not do what he did simply because their feet were dirty. He did it for another reason. He did it for a greater reason. You know why that teacher works all through the week studying their lesson? You know why that teacher spends time kneeling in prayer for the class? You know why those greeters, whether they want to or not, they put on a smile at the front door? You know why those children's workers show up for when they do? It's not. Listen to me. It's not just so kids can find their place. Our greeters know that for the most part, 99% of you can find the worship center. They know that. They're not greeting simply to show you where to go. They're not helping children simply to get them into their room. You know what they're doing? They have found a place to serve. And they realize and they are convinced that that act of service is not the reason why they're doing it. It is much bigger than that. They are shuttling kids into rooms because they know in those rooms those kids are going to be taught. They're serving and they're, they're praying and they're studying because they know that what they're delivering to those kids, even though they may not see it in their lifetime, they know they're hearing the word of God and they're planting seeds. You know why they serve? It's not because there's just a need that needs to be met, but there's a life that needs to be transformed. And Jesus was not doing what he was doing simply to clean off the dust and the sand of their feet. He was doing it for a much greater reason. It was something in verse 7 they would understand at a later time. Verse 8, 
Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Jesus was teaching that he was doing it for a deeper reason. Verses 13 through 16, what is he teaching us? He's teaching us that this is an example for us to be able to follow. Verse 17, he's doing it to give us a reminder of what it means to live a life that's blessed. Not to know these things. But blessed are you when you do them. I know. We are a church that has been in Joplin since 1889. And we have been blessed with faithful saints of God throughout the years, throughout the generations, in highs and lows that have stepped up to serve in areas to see the kingdom advance through this local body. And I know that it's easy sometimes for us to think, well, I've done my job. I've served. It's time to let some of the new blood in. When I read the New Testament, I don't find a spiritual retirement from service. In fact, you know what I find? I don't find people letting off the gas. I find people shifting gears. You know why? they know the day is coming close. I don't find people letting go. I find people admonished to continue to serve. I want to share a text with you. And I asked Katie if it was okay if I shared this with you. She sent me a text Friday. Friday, I got this text. We pick up children on Wednesday nights from Michigan Place Apartments. And right now we're picking up so many kids, we actually, we actually have to do something else. We have to. We don't have enough space for all the kids we're picking up. Church, let me tell you something. That's a problem that every church I know would want to have. That's a good problem. This is the text I got from Katie Friday. She says, I need you to help me ask for rotating CDL drivers. What we're meaning here is this. We have two 15-passenger vans, and we've got enough that's more than that. And we have a, pat, we have a CDL, 24-passenger van out there that requires a CDL. Our church has agreed to pay for anybody that wants to get that CDL. We will pay for that if you will be willing to help us drive. And we have very few takers on that. Listen to this. She says, I need you to help me ask for rotating CDL drivers. Kids want to come to church, and we can't without a bus. Please, please. I think if you ask, they will. This is about kids wanting to come learn about Jesus and excited about opening the Bible. I am sitting down with six of them for salvation next week. Amen. What if they have no seat to come? I say that. And I hope you hear my heart on this. I'm not sharing that with you to guilt anybody. I'm not. Guilt is a horrible motivator. God doesn't use it, nor should I. But at the same time, I want to tell you this. That bus is raucous. You're going to be driving that bus, and you're going to be wondering, is what I'm doing any good? Is all of the extra time invested? Is all of the patience that I barely hold on to as I'm driving, is it really worth it? You know what the answer is? Absolutely. Many of us cannot teach. Many of us cannot sing. I'm not asking this morning. When I'm talking about spiritual service, 
I'm saying this. Can you and I put aside who we think we are for a minute? And can you and I go back to John chapter 13? And can we see that action? Can we see who those recipients are? And can we see the man who bent his knee to wash? And can we say in our hearts this morning, God, I'm sorry. I have not been engaged. I'm not serving. Or I'm serving for selfish reasons. And this morning, could we say this? God, rearrange my priorities. Jesus, others, me. You may never see the true fruit of what your faithless, faithful, selfless act brings about. But church, I'm going to ask you today, will you look for an area to serve? Will you discipline yourself? It's not an attitude, it's an action. Will you look for an opportunity to be involved and engaged with the advancing of God's kingdom in this place and in your community, wherever you are? Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.